Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University, is going to address what arts exchanges have worked in the past, what works today, <laughs> why today is different, with a focus on how cultural activities impact conflict. Thanks very much, Joni. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, jump right into it. Um, there we go, jumping right into it. Because um, I'm going to have a little bit more of a foreign policy uh, approach. And I'm going to try to give you some examples that hopefully will persuade you <laughs> that exactly in this time of extreme conflict and so much turmoil in the world, this is exactly when culture plays such an important role and needs to be paid more attention to and used more effectively. So uh, culture, in all honesty, can both be part of the solution to conflicts, and it also can sometimes be a source of problems. On the positive side, it is, after all, culture, shared history, uh, performance passed on oral histories and music that really give anyone a sense of their identity. Culture, creative expression promotes all of the qualities we associate with a democratic society. Inquiry, critical thinking, holding governments accountable. After all, it's always the artists who are the dissenters in any society. So for these reasons, a strong and healthy culture, it really provides the foundation for stable, healthy societies, plus in many parts of the world, including, of course, here, uh, culture can be a very important source for economic development. On the negative side, uh, culture, and we could spend the whole night together talking about what culture means, uh, culture in the anthropological sense can also be the rationale, not a rationale I, I believe in, but can be the rationale for repression, for holding particular groups back, such as, for example, women in some uh, parts of the world. So, uh, you know, there are positive and negative sides, mostly positive. And for those positive reasons, all of the empowering aspects of culture, that's the reason that extremists always target culture. And this cartoon uh, where the man is saying, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my pick. Um, and there's a, this, this is reference to the extremist invasion of Mali in the spring of 2012, when the great uh, architecture, the mud brick architecture of the Renaissance period in Mali was attacked, the libraries were attacked, music was banned. Um, and sometimes I wonder, you know, extremists understand the importance of culture, such as, for example, the Taliban when they bombed the Buddhas in Bamiyan. They understand the importance of culture and the threat that it poses to their desire, whether they're in Afghanistan, whether they're the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, their desire for complete control of their populations. They understand the significance of culture. Do we? It's interesting to look at the history of, of cultural diplomacy in the United States. It has traditionally, I mean, it hasn't been a very long history, but in the past, whether it was in the lead up to World War II or whether it was in the Cold War period, there have been cultural surges, very strong cultural programs in response to conflict. You know, where culture is seen as an appropriate way of uh, combating a struggle for hearts and minds and ideology. The one exception to that rule is the post-September 11th period, which is very strange because we have been since then engaged in a conflict that is certainly more cultural than territorial, and yet culture has not been really harnessed um, engaged in this conflict. Now, while there are many lessons to be learned from the extremely effective Cold War diplomacy involving jazz and writers, uh, I don't think that's the exact model 
we need to follow now. We live in a very different era. We live, as you know, in an era of 24-7 communication, citizen journalism, uh, social media. Everyone is informed and connected all the time. And so the model of country A sending artists, just as Karen has explained, to country B is no longer exactly the model we want. Certainly a more collaborative approach is absolutely correct. And I would suggest uh, another way that culture is important, and that is culture as intake. Culture as a way to understand what is going on in other countries, looking to their cultural figures as a way to understand what's really going on. Think of the Egyptian revolution. Everyone in this country was, you know, all the policy experts were taken totally by surprise. Anyone who had been listening to music out of Egypt, watching movies out of Egypt, reading any of the blogs out of Egypt, the question wasn't, how could this be happening? The question was, why didn't this happen sooner? Because the artists always represent the voice of the people. And in many countries, governments suppress that voice. And so it's extremely important for the people making policy to hear that voice and to integrate it into the policy that they make. And I would suggest another model is then not necessarily to send Americans, but actually to leverage those local voices, to empower them to be effective in their own societies. Very often, they are the ones who are espousing values values that we agree with, and I'll give you some examples. And this applies also to social media. I'd suggest that it's more important to read it than post on it. Uh, so we're going to uh, look at four case studies, four different countries. It's going to be kind of a whirlwind tour, but I want to give you some different examples. Uh, this motto, a nation stays alive whose culture stays alive, is the motto of the Afghan National Museum. And you're looking here at one of the examples of the extraordinary gold treasures from Afghanistan and another sculpture that is in the museum. It is a miracle that this museum is open today, and it is. Uh, it's been attacked and bombed and, and almost destroyed multiple times. And I'm happy to say that the U.S. government gives it significant support. It is going to be enlarged. It's going to be made more secure so that eventually these incredible gold treasures can come back to the museum. Now, why would that be important with all the troubles Afghanistan has? Why should we worry about the museum? I had a direct experience of that when I visited the museum uh, in the company of the young man who served as my translator when I was there uh, a couple of years ago. Very intelligent young man, fluent in English, college educated. He'd never been to the museum before, not particularly surprising, he worked very hard. But he was spellbound at this museum. He read every single label. Uh, and when we left, he kind of scolded me for not spending more time there. And I said, well, so what was it about the museum that, that you liked so much? And he said two things. He said, I never knew Afghanistan had a Buddhist past, because of course there were all these Buddhist sculptures. And I'm sure if I said, well, don't you remember the Bamiyan Buddhas? Of course he knew about that. But that wasn't the same thing as understanding that his country was a center of Buddhist civilization. And the other thing he said was, I never knew that Afghanistan had such a great past, that it was at one point the center of civilization in Central Asia. Those two facts, think about knowing that the country once was Buddhist, what does that do to the extremist uh, narrative? And knowing that your country once has been graced for someone who's grown up in, in nothing but conflict gives you a completely different view on the future of your country and its potential. It's also been important in Afghanistan to revive contemporary culture. And one program that's been particularly effective in doing this is the Afghan Star Program, which is based on American Idol. And I'm a firm believer in the importance of the American Idol model. If you believe me or if you don't believe me even more, you can check out my TED Talk. But the reason is that it is a meritocracy. And you're looking here on one slide as the first day of tryouts for Afghan Star in Kabul a few years ago. And you can see tons and tons of people, you will notice they are men, lining up to try out. 
you will see women are important in this show also. This show, like American Idol, goes all over the country. Uh, people try out all over the country. You know, everyone has a chance. And just like American Idol, some people are terrible. And uh, some people are great. But in a country where tribal affiliations, family affiliations, and sadly, corruption uh, are very important, a place where you succeed as an individual purely on your own talent is hugely important. This show, the singers, by the way, sing Afghan music. So it also revives familiar Afghan songs. This turns out to be a tremendous place of empowerment for women and minorities. Because women have a chance just the same as anyone else. Every year a woman makes the finals. A woman hasn't won yet. The show's in its eighth season. Uh, it's seen on Tolo TV, which is part of Moby Media, the largest independent media company in Afghanistan. A woman hasn't won yet, but I think the surest sign of success is that more and more women try out every year. Uh, and this uh, young woman on the right, I talked to just before she went out onto the television to uh, be the um, MC for the finals one year. And she dressed exactly like that on television. She lived a, a pretty restricted life in Kabul, because you certainly can't go out like that on the streets. But she said to me, I do this deliberately. I am pushing open the door so others can follow after me. So this is a tremendous platform where a third of the country watches the finals, revives music, reminds people of their shared Afghan uh, heritage, and gives people a chance to prove themselves on their own uh, merits. Now, I don't want you to think that this is only Muslim-majority countries who have these problems and face these challenges. In Cambodia, when the Khmer Rouge uh, you know, exerted their reign of absolute terror, killing millions and exiling the entire country to labor camps in the countryside, what was the first thing they did? They went after the intellectuals and after culture. And they did their best to erase the extraordinarily rich Cambodian culture, which we in New York were treated to also at BAM um, a year and a half ago at the phenomenal season of Cambodia, which brought a month worth of incredible performances of all types, uh, including the famed Cambodian ballet, which was seen at BAM. But how does that country then grapple with this reign of terror, and how do they come back? The revival of culture has been hugely important, both for rediscovering their own incredible identity and history, and also understanding what happened, and telling those stories, share, sharing those stories between generations. Riti Pan, their best-known filmmaker, whose Oscar-nominated film, The Missing Picture, uh, attacks this story in an extraordinary way through these little carved figures that he made. But I love the, his quote where he says, I chose film, which shows the world, presents beauty, and also deals in words. I figure it keeps my fists in my pockets. Uh, and Riti alone is, is teaching a whole generation of Cambodian filmmakers, including this young woman, uh, who's, this is a clip from a documentary film about this woman, this Cambodian woman, who was one of the many who was forced into, you know, quote unquote marriage. I mean, she was taken by a Khmer Rouge person and raped systematically for a year or so. This young woman from the countryside, not particularly well educated, was determined to find the man who did this to her. She did. She was followed by a young documentary filmmaker who made a film about it. She found this man. He went before the tribunal. He was convicted. And now this young woman who actually experienced this um, is traveling all over the country telling her story, inspiring others, and showing the film and inspiring others to speak out. 
for the recovery of Cambodia, the economic recovery, which is also essential. Uh, its culture has been hugely important, and you see Angkor Wat on the right, an incredible tourist draw, and that's, that's an essential part of the revival of the Cambodian economy. And uh, the traditional cultures, such as shadow puppetry, which you see there on the left, have been revived and now go on actually at the temple as part of the season of Cambodia. Those shadow puppets performed in Brooklyn and something that was so moving, and this is another part of this post-conflict recovery, a huge number from the Cambodian diaspora came to watch them, and they watched them weeping. They thought this was dead. They thought shadow puppetry didn't exist anymore. And to see it performed so beautifully and their own identity reaffirmed, and they then met the actual Cambodians who came and all sorts of bonds were made, and that's another thing that will fuel that country in its continual uh, recovery. There are two examples where culture has played a role. Now I'm going to show you two where it's ongoing. Uh, I'm working currently on a project called the Timbuktu Renaissance, and the goal is using Mali in the country of Mali, where, as I'm sure you all know, Timbuktu is located. It's a real place, um, and this wonderful man, Salam Aud al Hajj, is one of the greatest scholars of Timbuktu, and he's standing in front of one of their famous carved doors. Um, and there's a, a view of the Grand Mosque of Timbuktu in this extraordinary architecture that the extremists attempted to destroy but didn't. Um, a group of us are working to foster peace, reconciliation, reconciliation between North and South Mali to counter extremism and to promote economic development all through a focus on culture. And this, of course, makes tremendous sense in Mali because Mali is both an incredible historic center of Islamic learning. This is Dr. Uh, Haidara, who was the man, you may have read the extraordinary story of the rescue of the manuscripts of Timbuktu when they were spirited out of Timbuktu in the middle of the night and sent down the Niger, hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. These manuscripts are a treasure trove of Islamic civilization. They date from the Renaissance period, same time as Leonardo da Vinci, they have scientific exploration. They talk about human rights, women's rights, animal rights, tolerance, plurality, all things that we don't particularly associate with Islam at the moment. Um, and so we are working to have them digitized. Others are working on this project also, have them restored, and most of all, have the story of these manuscripts and what they represent uh, be better known in the world and attract people back to Timbuktu to see them and learn more about this extraordinary civilization. And the other reason, of course, why Mali uh, is such a center of culture is for its music. Um, you may know that Malian music is actually the root of the blues. Bono calls it the big bang of all the music we love. Uh, and one of the great losses since the uh, invasion in 2012 has been the end of the famous Festival au Tessier, which was a pilgrimage for musicians all over the world, including people like Bono, Jimmy Buffett, uh, Tom Freston, who's uh, here today, came, you know, made the journey not just to Timbuktu, but actually outside Timbuktu, if you can imagine such a place, uh, along with thousands and thousands of, of Africans from all over the continent and also from all over Mali, north and south, totally united to hear this extraordinary music, hear the people flocking there. So we believe that using, and we're working very closely with the Malian government, who are totally supportive of this policy, we believe that culture is, is not only kind of a side nice thing to do, not that at all, but actually if you put it at the center of a strategy to reunite North and South in Mali to achieve peace, to achieve reconciliation and stability, and very importantly, to spur economic development through tourism and through um, commercial cultural products. That will be the best way to bring Mali back. I will end with one more example, 
Uh, and that is uh, related to another place torn in conflict today, Syria. Uh, I actually will be available only sh a little bit after the program because I'm flying tonight to Geneva to see this performance on Wednesday night, this performance of Syria, the Trojan Women. This is a performance done by Syrian refugee women, none of them actresses, all of them living in Amman, having fled their country, having seen their husbands and brothers, uh, and sons killed in front of them, left everything behind. They joined a drama therapy project that was offered in Amman, and they have put together an extraordinary production of Euripides' play, The Trojan Women, a play you know, 2,000 years old about the devastation of war. And in this particular production, they have both the text of Euripides and their own personal stories interwoven. So it is truly a demonstration of how timeless art can be. We attempted to bring this production to Georgetown, where I have a program there called the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. None of the women were granted visas to the United States. So instead, we held a program, which you see here, where we brought the women by Skype and showed clips from the documentary about the project, which is premiering, I think, almost as I speak at the Abu Dhabi Film Festival called Queens of Syria. So watch for that. That will be coming out here in a few months. Uh, and we brought the, the women were awake at 3 o'clock in the morning in Amman and spoke to us via Skype and had a chance actually to ask the brave representative of consular affairs at the State Department who was in the audience why they hadn't been granted their visas and received a standing ovation as you can see. And I can promise you if all of them come back from Sir Switzerland, we're applying again and we are going to get them uh, to Georgetown and you are all invited. But the reason that's so important is they bring the voices of ordinary Syrian citizens. You know, how can it be that we only pay attention to ISIS, these you know, few thousand extremists, when there are 200,000 people who've been killed in this conflict, three million refugees outside of Syria, six million interior displaced. Do we hear from them at all? Doesn't that pose a huge threat to stability and security? So we want to bring those voices uh, to you, uh, to everyone, hopefully, and you know, have us pay attention to them as well. So in conclusion, I think that culture is actually more important than ever at this time. And you know, if the extremists understand how important it is for their purpose, uh, why don't we? Uh, because culture and creative expression foster just the qualities that are needed for just democratic societies. And they provide the source of identity that equips people to build their countries in a stronger way and to resist uh, extremism and empowers uh, minorities and women uh, and provides the foundation for just societies. So thank you.